My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm a little hungover. I probably still reek of booze, but I am going to break down the entire UFC San Diego fight card, giving you our picks, our bets, and our predictions, and we've been killing it. If you've been watching lately, we've been crushing bets, crushing picks, and this has been going really, really well. So let's hopefully continue that success into what was a pretty mediocre fight card, UFC San Diego, but they've added some fights, they've moved some. So let's just go ahead and jump in. But before I jump in, here's the premium member plug. The reality is premium members are tailing us ahead of a lot of these bets and we're getting ahead of the lines. We were way ahead of the Sergey Spivak line, way ahead of the Brian Battle line. I hammered the Jason Witt takedown prop line, which we were so ahead of, and it got so much action, they literally don't even take bets on that anymore. So moral of the story is premium membership is paying for itself. Sign up now. It's literally $10 a month. That's $2.50 per event for the most part. You're getting bets weeks or months in advance. You're getting fantasy tools. You're getting an exclusive parlay that's only for members that has been cashing one good week, and it pays for a year or more of membership, depending on how much you bet. Check it out. Go to wewantpicks.com. Scroll to the top and click become a member. It is only $10 a month. We're not going to mess with that price. And all we're going to do is continue to add content and make it the best $10 value in the history of sports betting and fantasy. That's wewantpicks.com. Scroll to the top. Click become a member. And as always, if you want 50 bucks, we literally just send you $50 as a thank you. All you need to do is go to wewantpicks.com slash bets, sign up with any one of our betting partners, and I send you $50 as a thank you after you make a deposit. Wewantpicks.com slash bets, sign up with any partner, make a deposit, I send you 50 bucks, Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, literally however you want it, we pay out thousands of dollars a month to people who do that. So we on picks.com slash bets. Now we can jump into the fights and opening up the UFC San Diego, at least we think this the fight order is probably gonna change, but opening up UFC San Diego, we've got Jason Witt versus Josh Quinlan. And that has just moved a week. That was supposed to be this past weekend, but they moved it because Josh Quinlan failed a, a piss test. And the substance he failed for is not allowed in Nevada but it is not on the banned substance list for USADA. So he's not suspended. He didn't break any actual UFC or USADA rules, but Nevada doesn't allow this. So they just moved it a week, and that fight will be in California. For the most part, the analysis stays the same, but essentially, let's go ahead and break this down. We got Jason Witt taking on Josh Quinlan. And Jason Witt's a wrestler. He's a grinder. He's only looking for takedowns. TKO is mostly on top, but there's submissions there. Um, if you give it to him, he has no intention on engaging in a kickboxing match. And that's totally fine because his standup is just okay and his chin is not great. When he gets on top, and I'm saying when and not if, because he averages almost seven takedowns per 15 minutes, which is nuts. It's just inevitable he'll be on top. And when he's there, he's got great control, great pressure, and he uses that to pound away. He's not really going to look for a submission, but if you squirm to avoid those strikes from top, he will sneak something in and work from there. He's coming off that loss to Philip Rowe, which is like a perfect window of who Jason Witt is as a fighter. He got the takedowns. <clears throat> he got the control, control time. I told you I'm hungover. He got the takedowns. He got the control time. He was dominating that fight and then... Only eight strikes were landed by Philip Rowe, and that's all he needed to knock out Jason Whip. Josh Quinlan's a dangerous striker, and he's got very real power. He's coming off an incredible knockout on the Contender Series, but then he did have some USADA issues, so they overturned that, and they made it a no contest. He is just a striker, though. He's got a BJJ in uh, brown belt. He actively competes in grappling competitions, and he's a very dangerous guy who has not been to a decision in his professional career. And it's a pretty straightforward breakdown. If Josh can defend the takedowns, he gets a knockout and he wins this fight. If he cannot defend the takedowns, Jason Witt takes him down, pounds him out, probably gets 25, 30 takedowns, and that's the end of it. So it's, it's very, very straightforward. And frankly, when I saw this fight was moved a week, I was like, oh man, I, I, gotta, put, I gotta pit chicken with Jason Witt. But then I saw, oh, it was just a little bit of a hot piss test. It wasn't a medical thing. It wasn't an injury. <clears throat> they're both just going to have to cut weight and do it all over again. So they're both in the same boat. So 
I still think I'm going with Josh Quinlan here. Um, you know, Jason Witt's probably one of the more live underdogs because of the wrestling, but because of his chin, it really just eliminates any of that. I, if you watched us last week, Bet Online has prop bets, and one of them is who will get more takedowns in this fight. There's not a line; it's not over two. It's just who will get more takedowns in this fight. The Jason Witt line opened at minus three twenty-five, and I hammered it. And we put it up there for premium members to hammer as well. And some of you tagged along. And then it got so much action. And I think they realized there's a 0% chance this bet doesn't cash. So they literally took it down. They, it wasn't an option last week. We'll see at, you know, towards the end of the week. They kept my bet. Even though this moved the week, they didn't cancel it. They kept it. I still have my bet. If they put this line back up, it's going to be very interesting to see what it is. It might be like minus 5,000, which honestly is what it should be. But anyway, I got that at minus 325. Keep an eye. Bet Online drops those props on Tuesdays. I would just be clicking refresh all day and see what it pops up as. And you should absolutely hammer that line. And then we got Yusuf Zalal taking on Damon Blackshear. Yusuf Zalal is a very well-rounded fighter. He likes to hang on the outside, and then he comes in with solid takedowns. He averages more than two takedowns per fight, but he does have a low accuracy of 29%. His striking style is to stay on the outside, but with Damon's speed and entries, that could be hard to do. While Zalal can be very low volume output, and he does have incredible defense, he is only hit with 1.74 significant strikes per minute, which considering he has six decisions in the UFC, that's actually an incredible statistic. Damon Blackshear has taken this fight on short notice, and it's his UFC debut, but he's got plenty of experience, and he has earned this opportunity. Similar to how Chris Curtis got into the UFC, right? He had plenty of experience, was on the UFC's radar, but he stepped up on short notice to actually get that call up. He's an athletic striker with impressive speed and power. He can grapple, and we saw that in his incredibly slick back take in his CFFC title win. But his losses are essentially all grappling base, where he's just taken down and held down. And listen, Yusuf should win this fight. He should be able to get the takedowns and control Damon the same way that Danny Sabatello did. But damn, dude, Damon is dangerous, well-trained, and should have enough experience to not get caught up in the moment. If this was not short notice, I would love Damon here, and he would absolutely, without hesitation, be my pick. But my hesitation right now is just how tough Zalal is. He's almost impossible to finish, so even if Blackshear has success early, he will need to keep the pace and avoid the takedowns for another you know, 10 minutes or whatever. And on short notice, I don't know if he can. I still am going to put my neck out there and, and pick Damon to win here, but I'm going to keep my money. I am not going to bet on this fight. But I do think Damon can pull it off, and it's really just going to come down to his conditioning and, and can he defend some of these takedowns so he isn't held down the whole time. And then we've got Angela Hill taking on Lupita Godinez. And this fight is a late addition to the card. This was originally booked for October 15th, so a couple months away. But I think they looked at UFC San Diego and they said, this card's kind of trash. Who, please, anybody... Who is willing to fight two months before their scheduled fight? And these two said yes. So they brought this fight in two months. It is at a catch weight because of that, but they'll both be in the same boat as far as weight concerned because you know, they were booked to fight. So neither one of them are technically short notice, but very weird timing how that all came together. And I'm very confident in my pick here, but uh, Angela Hill, she's, she's a hot and cold fighter, but she does have incredible fight IQ and she's pretty good on her feet. She's fast. She's got lots of versatility and volume, but she's got absolutely no power. And when breaking down her fights, you'll typically see that Angela beats the people she's supposed to, like Ashley Yoder, and then loses to the ones she's supposed to, like Tisha Torres, Michelle Waterson, and recently Amanda Lamoche, even though you know a lot of people think Angela won that fight. But I gotta be honest, that Verna Janaroba loss, it looks like the beginning of the end. She was taken down three times, she was controlled for seven minutes, and she is a talented fighter who has become the gatekeeper and measuring stick of this weight class, but I think her best days are behind her. She's good everywhere, not a threat. Her path to victory in this and every other fight is to stick and move, avoid the power, and avoid the takedowns. Lapita Godinez is very big. She's a strong wrestler with solid striking, and she's got some real power and clean boxing. She's got great setups to both her wrestling and striking. She's very big for this weight class, and she uses that size and strength well to execute her game plan. 
She's got two losses in the UFC. The Jessica Panay loss was just a straight up bad decision. And the Loera Candelita loss was on short notice up a weight class. And she just struggled to be the bully. But she just absolutely destroyed Ariane Carnalozzi in her last fight. And I think it's going to be more of the same here. I'm 100% all in on Loopy in this fight. I think she bullies the hell out of Angela. Has zero issues doing it. And I might be way too high on her here. But I think she should be a parlay piece. You should have a money line on her. And that takedown line with Bet Online I talked about, that should be hammered as well. So again, Bet Online has prop bets. And one of those prop bets is who will get more takedowns in this fight? They have not dropped either the money line odds for this fight or those props. But as soon as they do, I will hammer it. And if you want to do the same, I'll give you 50 bucks. So go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. We have five betting partners. Bet online is the one that honestly, they're the best partner for MMA, but you can get some better matches and stuff with the other books. But anyway, if you go to wewantpicks.com slash bets, you sign up with bet online, you make a deposit. I'll send you 50 bucks as a thank you for supporting us and them. And it's just simple math, right? You sign up with them. You make a deposit, they take care of us, we take care of you, and we're all in this together just trying to get rich, taking money from these sports books. So Lapita Cadenas is the pick, and I'm going to be doing everything with her. Probably a money line bet, definitely that takedown prop bet, most likely more on takedowns in prize picks, more on strikes in Monkey Knife Fight, literally everything that I can do with her, I will do, I'm that confident, on Lupita Cadenas. Then we got Ode Osborne taking on Tyson Nam. Tyson Nam coming back after about a year and a half away. Ode Osborne is a southpaw striker who uses range well to keep people at the end of his punches. He's got a ton of power and has great finishing ability, especially at his new home of 125 pounds, where he's currently 2-0. He has four wins in the UFC with takedowns in two of them, and he may use some of that grappling in this matchup to avoid the big power of Nam. And Tyson Nam's a low-volume striker with some very real power and solid takedown defense. His striking is technical, and he has phenomenal counters. His knockout of Adeshev was a perfect showcase for that. He ate a leg kick and then just fired back with a straight right to get that KO. And while Nam has a ton of power at this weight class, he doesn't necessarily have the same speed as the rest of the division. He's two and three in the UFC, but his losses are to Sergio Pettis, Kaikara France, and Matt Schnell, so they're pretty solid losses. And at one point in time, Tyson Nam was legit, but we're a year and a half removed from his last fight, two years removed from his last win, and he's almost 40 years old. This is primarily a striker versus striker matchup, but both of these men have negative striking differentials and have been on the wrong side of a KO. But outside of some very real power from Nam, I think Ode is all around the better fighter. If you go back to Tyson's losses, he essentially loses to speed and volume. Pettis more than doubled his strikes, and both Schnell and France almost did the same. Nam's power is an asset, of course, but he also relies on it too much, which is how he ends up behind on the scorecards. I got to go with Ode here to stay busy, threaten takedowns, and get his third win at 125 pounds. I got a money line bet on him at minus to 20 become a premium member i just gave you that bet so you can follow it right now without being a premium member but we have other bets listed on the website for premium members and we have been ahead of every single one of those lines the last couple of weeks i mentioned earlier we beat the brian battle line we beat the sergey spivak line beat the jason witt line so we on picks.com scroll to the top click become a member it's only 10 bucks and it will pay for itself if you hit a couple of these bets with us then we have another rebooked fight from last week. We've got Ariana Lipsky taking on Priscilla Kachera. And this was rebooked from UFC Vegas 59 because Lipsky had medical issues on fight night. She also missed weight. So those things are definitely related. Um, you know, and I guess we'll see if she can get her act together for this coming week in San Diego. And Ariana Lipsky is a solid striker. She's got good grappling as well. She's coming off a solid win over Mandy Bohm, where she doubled her strikes and defended all four takedowns. And the key to that fight was defending the takedowns because it broke a two-fight skid where the takedowns were an issue for her. But she does have decent grappling. The issue is she needs to dictate it, meaning she's got to be on top for her to use her grappling. Off her back, she can definitely struggle. Priscilla Cachera has heavy pressure and throws heavy punches. She's coming off a very sketchy win over Ji Yun Kim where she landed 70 strikes less 
and had a total of 30 seconds of control time, but still got that decision, which she did not deserve. She is primarily a striker, but she does have okay takedown defense at 65% and a low takedown accuracy at 33%. She's got very real power for the division, but she can be KO or bust. If you look at the stats, you'll notice Priscilla's striking differential of about four to seven, which means for every four significant strikes she lands, she's hit seven times. And if you look closer at her losses, she was absolutely dominated on her feet with her opponents essentially doubling her strike totals in all of those. And listen, last week, before weight issues, before cancellations, I liked Ariana Lipsky in this fight. with And you know, without the real takedown threat, from Priscilla, I thought she'd be able to get her hands going and touch her up the same way she did Mandy. But missing weight, then not fighting, then cutting weight a few days later for this event, I, th I think it might be a problem for her. I'm full on switching my pick. I'm going Priscilla Cachera here. She was always the more dangerous fighter in this matchup. I didn't think she was the better fighter, but she was always the more dangerous one. But now we got Lipsky, who will likely not be at 100%, may fade later in the fight. You know, all of a sudden, Priscilla Cachera is looking pretty good. So uh, flip the pick here. I'm going Priscilla Cachera for UFC San Diego. Then we got Gabriel Benitez taking on Charlie Ontiveros. Gabriel Benitez is a very good kickboxer and specifically has great kicks and solid movement. He picks his shots well and has very real power. His takedown defense is at 58%. His takedown offense is at 50%. And while he does have grappling tools with solid BJJ, he just doesn't use them. He only has one single takedown in 12 UFC fights, and he has fallen in love with chasing the knockout. Charlie Ontiveros is coming off back-to-back -back losses in the UFC, both by finish. In fact, he has been finished in every single one of his losses. He's a striker with a traditional martial arts background, which means he's got that wonder boy stance. So it's super wide, but he's also wild. He throws unorthodox strikes while chasing a finish, and he's pretty fun to watch. He does not have much to offer on the ground, but will always make it interesting on the feet. He's absolutely massive for this weight class at six feet, two inches tall, and he has fought at 185 and 170 most of his career, so coming all the way down to 155 is incredible. On its surface, a guy like Benitez, who's one and four in his last five, being a minus 360 favorite might seem absolutely crazy, but his losses are quality and his opponents are not. Regardless of, not, not his opponents that the people he fought, meaning Charlie's losses are just not quality. Regardless of how exciting Charlie is to watch, he has chin issues and holes in his game. His 11 wins are against very low levels of competition. And I expect Gabriel to be faster, more technical, and absolutely the better grappler, even though he's probably not going to use it. So Gabriel's the pick. And he's probably safe to be a parlay piece. And speaking of parlays, if you go to wewantpicks.com, scroll to the top, click become a member, you'll enter the membership portal. And we have a safety parlay that we do every single week. Two legs, three legs, and four legs. That has cashed, I think, three out of the last four weeks. We did miss last night because of Vicente Luque, but we still hit the third leg and the fourth leg. It was just Vicente that screwed us up. Anyway, it pays for itself. We want picks.com. Scroll to the top. Click become a member. It is only $10 and you'll get all sorts of exclusive bets, fantasy tools, and everything else you need to make some money. Then we've got a couple of heavyweight bangers here. We got Lucas Bretsky taking on Martin Bidet. Lucas Bretsky is coming off an impressive contender series win that was flipped to a no contest because of performance enhancing drugs in his system. He's a well-rounded heavyweight with solid power, solid speed, decent takedowns, and nice leg kicks. He's very athletic and has no problem working spinning attacks. The problem with Lucas, though, is if you dig into his fights and watch tapes, he does not like getting hit, and obviously nobody does, but if you stay in his face with volume, he literally will turn his head away and just cower instead of circling out and countering. Martin Bidet is a heavy-handed striker with solid footwork and very real power. He is interesting because all of his wins are by stoppage, and it's very clear that he's got that power, but in the past, he has been a slow starter. So if you go back and watch his fight at Octagon, that's okay T-A-G-O-N, you'll see that even though his footwork is solid and he's always moving, he gets hit and he doesn't always engage. His contender series win was very impressive. And the reality is that even though he may be slow to engage, when he does engage, everything has power. 
even his jab. He's coming off that win over Chris Barnett, which is listed as a technical decision, but the reality is he broke Chris. And Chris tried to take the Aljamain Sterling way out, but because they were in the third round, it went to a decision, and Martin got the win, but he beat the crap out of Chris in that fight. It was not a decision. I don't know what to do with this fight because I think Lucas might actually be the better all-around fighter. He's athletic. He has power. He can work in takedowns. Like, can he really do something here? But I mentioned how he looks away when strikes come at him, and I think that's going to be a problem in this fight and others. But Bidet can be low volume, so it's not like he's necessarily going to just stay in his face with strikes, which means Lucas may have the freedom to work his own offense. Ultimately, I am going to go with Bidet here because I think his power is going to be the difference. I don't like him at 2-1 to one odds, so I'm not going to have a money line bet on him. But what I am going to do with him is throw him in my monkey knife fight, not, but, 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 uh, monkey knife fight knockout kings. If you don't know what that is, monkey knife fights daily fantasy. And one of the games that they have is called Knockout Kings. You can pick any three fighters on a fight card. And if one of them wins by KO or TKO, you get 25% net profit. Just 25% more money back to you. If two of them win by KO or TKO, you two and a half times your money. Three, you six times your money, but don't chase the three. If you want to check it out, I will have Bidet in my Knockout Kings. That I think that's cashed every single week, ever. I don't know if we've ever missed. I'll have to check to see what we did last week, but I don't think we've ever missed. Go to wewantpicks.com slash MKF. If you sign up through there, they will match your deposit. Take the free deposit. You give them 50, they'll give you 50, 100, they'll give you 100. Take that free money, put it on a knockout Kings. Have bidet. We'll talk about some others to throw in there as well, but that's an easy way to make some money when you know there's going to be some knockouts. Then we've got Yasmin Jargui taking on Eisman Lucindo. Yasmin Gargui is a powerful striker with a very promising career. She has fantastic pressure and very impressive combinations. She'll enter the pocket with a high kick and then just finish with overhands and uppercuts. If she smells blood, she will fire everything at you to get the finish. As impressive as her striking is, her grappling is solid as well. She's got fantastic body lock takedowns and takedown defense that she uses to end up on top. She is early in her career, but it's looking like Yasmin may be a problem for the division. Eisman Lucindo is a grappler who uses her power to clinch and then drag her opponents to the ground. Once on the ground, she's got solid top pressure where she uses strikes to loosen you up before transitioning to a submission. Her striking is just okay, right? She essentially just waits for you to throw and then counters and rushes in looking for the takedowns. Her game plan is always to get on top and control the fight from there. I absolutely love Yasmin in this fight. Obviously, there's some questions around her takedown defense and her BJJ off her back, but I think I've watched enough tape to see just how solid that defense is. She's got fantastic hips, and she uses underhooks really well to shuck off shots and then either strike from there or scramble to get her own takedown. So Yasmin is the pick. The minus 240 odds are solid. I think those are correct. And the only reason I'm hesitant to actually bet on that is because they're both making their UFC debut... And, you know, I just, I hate just throwing money at that, but I may hit that line. It's minus 240 now. I know that's going to move. Yasmin's going to be a much bigger favorite by the end of the week. So if you want to get ahead of that, you're not worried about the UFC debut aspect, jump on it, get ahead of it. I imagine it's going to be money well spent. That takes us to our third rebooked fight on this card. We have Cynthia Calvillo taking on Nina Nunez. This fight was rebooked from UFC Vegas 58 a couple of weeks ago. Cynthia Calvillo is pretty well-rounded. She's a good striker, good grappler. She has takedowns. And while she's very well-rounded, she's pretty slow for the division and does not have much power. When she gets you on the ground, she's very solid. She'll soften you up with strikes to sink in a submission. The biggest issue for her, however, is that it's obvious that she isn't comfortable in a lot of striking exchanges. And it's easy to say she's on a three-fight skid, but even though two of them were knockouts, they were two solid opponents in Andrea Lee, Jessica Andrade, and Caitlin Chikagian. Nina Nunez is Amanda Nunez's wife, and her maiden name is Nina Ansaroff. So if you're doing research, you may have to look up Nina Ansaroff to find old fight footage. And this is her second fight back since having a baby, and her first fight in more than a year. There are definitely some unknowns coming into this. 
Skill wise, she's very well rounded. She isn't the better striker. She isn't, or sorry, she isn't the best striker. She isn't the best grappler, but she's got solid fundamentals everywhere and really only loses to specialists, meaning she'll lose to a very high level grappler. She'll lose to a very high level striker, but she doesn't lose to other well rounded women because she's usually more solid in every individual aspect instead of just being amazing at one thing. I get why Calvillo's the favorite. She was the favorite last time. She's the favorite this time. She averages almost two takedowns per fight, and Nina's last two losses were grappling-based. But I got to go with Nunes here. I think Calvillo is definitely the better fighter overall, even though I just said Nina's <laughs> the more well-rounded. But I do think Cynthia is the, the better fighter. I think she's the more talented fighter. But if you look at that Andrade loss, it took something out of her. She's just not the same person. In her loss to Andrea Lee, she quit on that stool. Her shot attempts look terrible. She's never been a good striker. So all of that promising, athletic, talented, Cynthia Calvillo, like, ball of energy, that's gone. That's gone. That was just taken away from her. Jessica Andrade beat it out of her, and she's just not the same person. Nina Nunes... I got to go with her to be more consistent in each aspect. She's incredibly tough. She will not break. She will not quit. And we just saw how amazing Amanda Nunes looked. I imagine she was a part of that training camp. Obviously, the gym change, having a child. There are some unknowns. But I still like Nuna in the, Nina in this matchup as the underdog to beat Cynthia Calvillo. That takes us to Devin Clark. And Azamat Mirzakhanov. Devin Clark's a solid grappler with a well-rounded striking game. He doesn't have the best chin, but he does have solid footwork and heavy hands. He'll throw head kicks while moving forward, but ultimately, he's looking to crowd his opponents so he can take them down. Once he takes them down, he's looking to strike and work for the TKO more than he's looking for a submission. He's coming off that win over William Knight where he was almost put out early, but he was able to survive, and then he got his own stoppage. Azamat Mirzakhanov is not the biggest light heavyweight in the division, but he makes up for his physical stature with legit power. He is fast and heavy-handed. He's a good wrestler with solid ground and pound, but his hands are so good that he really doesn't even go to that wrestling often. He had a great contender series win in the summer of 2021, and then a knockout over Tafan Chukwi back in March. But Tafan win wasn't as great as the Tapology uh, win knockout might tell you because he was probably going to lose a decision there. He was dead gassed. And the only reason he got the stoppage win was because Tafan's coach told Tafan, you have to charge forward. You have to get a finish, which was the dumbest thing. He did not need to do that. He was going to win a decision. And while coming forward, while like, you know, overly extending himself, Azmat landed a beautiful left and then a knee and he got it done. The, it's a tricky fight, though, because Devin Clark's a solid grappler with chin issues, and Azmat's an undersized light heavyweight with cardio issues. Both men have shown that they can deal with some adversity for a comeback. I'm going to go with Mirzakhanov here because he's the more dangerous guy, and even though Devin survived William Knight's early onslaught, I'm not sure he can survive it here. Not to mention Azmat has his own wrestling credentials. So I like the value here as well at minus 170. The line should probably be closer to minus 200. So at minus 170, I think Azmat Mirzakhanov is a solid bet, and I think he absolutely gets it done here. Then we've got Bruno Silva taking on Gerald Mearshart. Gerald Mearshart's a very good grappler who's always live for a submission. He's not great on his feet, and people absolutely question his chin. But I think he proved some people wrong in his last couple of fights, that his chin can hold up to some of the tests. His biggest issue is he's built an entire career on getting pummeled and then pulling off a submission win. He's an incredibly talented grappler, but he doesn't have very good offensive wrestling even though he averages a little over two takedowns per fight, he's only got a 40% takedown accuracy, and some of those entries are pretty bad. Bruno Silva is a very well-rounded fighter who has proved to be talented and tough. He's coming off that loss to Alex Pajeda, but he did have some moments of success in that fight. He won a few of the exchanges. He had two takedowns, three minutes of control time, and Alex could potentially be the middleweight champion six months from now. Before that fight, he had three knockouts in the UFC, and while they all were knockouts, they weren't without adversity. Andrew Sanchez took Bruno down seven times before being knocked out. But if that showed me anything, is that Bruno has mental and physical toughness to never be out of a fight. 
He's a fantastic striker. He's got solid BJJ. And I keep talking about his knockouts, but not all of them are on his feet. Some of them he lands, gets to the ground, ground and pounds, and goes from there. So I love Bruno Silva in this fight. Gerald Mearshart has one single path to victory here, and that is the get his ass kicked, pull off a submission path. Again, the issue for Mearshart, he's got no offensive wrestling. He doesn't have clean takedowns to force it to the ground, so it's going to be on its feet. I see Bruno doing whatever the hell he wants to do on his feet, and even if he is somehow taken down, I don't think it's going to be an issue. Gerald's BJJ is phenomenal, but Bruno Silva also has solid BJJ, and Bruno Silva is an easy pick for me. I have two-unit money line bet on him, two. I think he absolutely gets this done. I think he can be the backbone of some parlays, and I'm going to have him in my monkey knife fight knockout kings. I just did the whole spiel there, but go to wewantpicks.com slash m. KF, you sign up, they'll instantly match your deposit, do knockout kings, throw Bruno Silva in there, and um, you're not going to be upset because he's going to knock out Jared Mealshart here. I hope it's a two and a half round line so I can do the under. We'll find out in a few days. If it's one and a half, we'll see. I, I hate messing with one and a halves. Anyway, Bruno Silva, absolutely, without a doubt, the pick. Then we got the co main event of the evening. We got David Onama taking on Nate Landwehr. David Onama just fought a few weeks ago, and he's making a pretty quick turnaround here. Style-wise, he's a kickboxer who likes to plot forward and control the pace. Typically, he isn't incredibly high volume, but he is effective. He has a very long jab, and he's constantly throwing it out there, but he does tend to throw just one or two punches at a time, unless he's in the clinch where he's busy with knees and elbows. If you can back him up and use volume, you may be able to get him out of a rhythm. Nate Landwehr is the definition of feast or famine. He's going to go out there, be busy as hell, run forward, throw wild, and just look for a finish at all costs. He's a talented guy with power and skills, but is almost too focused on being fun and exciting that he puts himself in harm's way for no reason. He's never been in a boring fight, and I just don't anticipate this being one either. He's coming off the very impressive win over Ludovic Klein, where he more than doubled his strikes before taking him down and submitting him. Anytime you have someone like, like Nate with craziness and forward pressure, you can always have an upset. And if Nate wrestled more, he could potentially be the pick here. We watched Mason Jones take down Onama eight times in that fight. And if you couple that with Nate's just pressure with his striking, he really could give Onama some trouble. Nate is 2-2 two and two in the UFC. His two losses were stoppages to Herbert Burns, yikes, and Julian Erosa. But his wins are impressive. He beat Darren Elkins, who we know is ridiculously tough, and Ludovic Klein, who was Jacob's you know wild underdog lock of the week just a few weeks ago. And I've got to go with Onama here because of his power and it's, it's just so next level. And I think he's going to be more technical as well. But Nate is one of the more live underdogs on this card, literally because of the forward pressure. But if he gives Onama any room to breathe, any room to settle into a rhythm, Onama's going to get it done and probably get the knockout. So he's the pick. He's another knockout Kings uh, monkey knife I played. Actually, I just built you. There's your three knockout Kings right there. And then we've got... The main event of the evening, we got Chito Vera taking on Dominic Cruz. And listen, a lot of you remember how bitter I was after the Rob Font fight. At no point did I think Rob Font won that fight. My only point was Rob Font was the better striker. He completely outlanded Cheeto, but Cheeto's got such stupid power, it didn't even matter. Anyway, Marlon Vera, or Cheeto Vera as we know him, is a Muay Thai striker who likes to fight ugly. He does a great job using all of his tools, his elbows, his knees, his hands, and his feet for a pretty versatile attack style. And to round out his dangerous striking, he also has solid submissions and an iron jaw. He's got a ton of stoppage power and finishes. He does have a negative striking differential. So he is hit more often than he hits other people. And he is hittable. But he does a really good job of mixing in takedowns. So when he does get in trouble, he shoots those takedowns and gives himself a break. He took down both Davy Grant and Song Yudong twice. He's coming off that win over Rob Font where it was clear that Cheeto was not the more technical fighter, but absolutely the more dangerous one. He was outstruck by more than 100 strikes but he still left Rob Font bloodied and beaten. Dominic Cruz is the former king of the division, and in a lot of people's eyes, the greatest bantamweight of all time. 
He has wins over all-time greats and current contenders. He basically invented that heavy movement style. He's always working side to side and cutting angles, constantly moving his lower body and upper body, which just frustrates his opponents and opens them up for takedowns. And that's his entire game. Frustrate people with the movement, get them guessing, keep them behind you, and take shots. He averages almost three takedowns per fight and has a 71% striking defense. That is one of the highest striking defense percentages you will ever see. So statistically, this guy is impossible to hit. He's very hard to hit. And that's because he's at constantly moving and his head is never, it's not even moving the same direction as his feet or his body. And he's just, he's just a puzzle and it's hard for people to figure out. And this is a really hard fight to pick. It, it really is. I know, I know what the comment section is going to look like. Cheeto, Cheeto. People aren't even going to watch this whole video before you start commenting. Cheeto wins, Cheeto wins, Cheeto wins. And this is a really tough pick because Cheeto absolutely, without a doubt, is the more dangerous fighter in this matchup. We saw in his last fight that even if he lands half the strikes as his opponent, he can do 10 times the damage. The difference here, though, is that Dominic is almost impossible to hit. In his 17-fight UFC career, only one single time has someone landed more than 74 strikes. And, and think about how many five-round fights this man has been in. 74 is nothing, and that's total strikes, not significant. Only one time has somebody landed more than that, and that was TJ Dillashaw in a fight that Dominic won pretty clearly. So I have no doubt that Dominic is the better fighter in this matchup, but I have, do have doubt that is being the better fighter enough? It wasn't enough for Rob Font. I think Cheeto can win with power and takedown defense. And I think Dominic can win with striking defense and wrestling. I can only see Dominic win if he mixes in those takedowns and just makes those rounds clear, right? Get, get a takedown, that round's mine. Get a takedown, that round's mine. Frankie Edgar was horribly knocked out, right? But he outstruck Cheeto. And he got three takedowns in three rounds. You guys are going to hate me for this. I think Dominic can pull this off, but make sure you watch our Tuesday night breakdown because I'm so on the fence with this pick. I might change it, but listen, guys, before you start hating me for, oh, you hate Cheeto Vera. I think Cheeto Vera is amazing and a ton of fun to watch. I just, at a certain point, getting hit twice as many times as you hit other people is going to catch up to you and, and relying only on your power is going to be tricky, especially against a guy like Dominic Cruz who doesn't get hit. Right now, Dominic Cruz is the pick, but I'm really on the fence. That might change. Guys, thank you so much for the watch. Make sure you like, subscribe, do all the things, and become a premium member as I scroll to the top. Become a premium member. It's $10 a month. And the amount of bets and content we give you in premium membership, it will pay for many months or years, depending on what your units look like. We want picks.com. Scroll to the top, click become a member. It's $2.50 a week. So basically per event, that's nothing. That pays for itself. We could have one out of 10 good months and that will pay for itself. We on picks.com. Scroll to the top, click become a member. And don't forget, you want that $50 bonus? We on picks.com slash bets. Sign up with any one of our partners. Make a deposit. I'll send you 50 bucks. Cash app, PayPal, Venmo, however you want it. Thanks for everything. Check out our Tuesday night live streams.